Good afternoon, my name's Helen Adams, and today I'd like to talk to you about work I'm doing in North Wales using Tableau. Before I get going, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about myself, and being British, I thought I'd start with the weather. I grew up in the Midlands, university in my career took me to London first and then Norfolk, and then 17 years ago we swapped the sunshine of the East Coast for millimetres of rain in North West Wales. Having said that, for the past couple of weeks home has been absolutely stunning. I started working in the NHS in Wales 15 years ago. I currently work as a business analyst in prescribing and medicines management. I have a split, split role working both locally and nationally. So, jump to slide. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of background work. I'm going to talk about a research study we did on the Clostridium difficile, and then I'm going to look at prescribing in Wales. Um, C. diff is a hospital acquired infection, a, host, a healthcare associated infection that's caused us quite a lot of problems. The research study was undertaken in 2015 16, and in it and in the prescribing work, Tableau has been really, really important. Excuse my pointer. For those of you who are not aware, um, the health service in Wales is set up differently from the health service in England. Um, this happened following devolution, so we don't have a purchase of provider split. We don't have CCGs, we have integrated health boards which cover, cover primary and secondary care. And we have seven of them in Wales. I work for BCU Health Board which is up in North Wales. We have a population of some, some 700,000 patients. We have a budget of 1.3 billion pounds. We cover 2,000 square miles. We have three DGHs the kind of dark circles, a range of community mental health facilities and 107 GP practices. Drive time north to south is about two hours and east to west about two and a half hours. We're a very rural, mixed community. So why does C. diff matter? Well, estimates suggest that patients who contract C. diff will have an increased length of stay of about 11 days. This will put about £12,000 on the cost of their care. Between 9 and 38% of, of the patients who catch C. diff will die within 30 days. And of those patients, C. diff will be the cause of death for about 20% of them. Why does C. diff matter for BCU? So this is um, C. diff rates for our three main hospitals from 2000, 2012 to 2017. And what we can see is the blue lines are the inpatient incidents, the brown, brown, the brown run charts are patients who caught C. diff in the community. Hospital 2 had a huge spike in C. diff numbers in early 2013. C. diff is a bacterial infection that is routinely monitored nationally. When we looked at ourselves compared to all other health boards and CCGs in England and Wales, we had the highest C. diff rates. The NHS is only ever in the news, apart from today when it's its birthday, when it's bad news. And we had huge problems with <coughs> um, loss of credibility following this outbreak of C. diff. There were calls for corporate manslaughter inquiries pressure in the health service was huge. Prosecutions were never made, but there are a number of areas of work that span out of the outbreak. An easy assumption to make, and one frequently made by the media, is that healthcare associated infections are by and large an infection prevention problem. Dirty hospitals and that kind of thing, which means it's somebody else's problem. The work I'm going to talk about supports scientific evidence that it's growing scientific evidence that it is more complicated than that, and the overuse of antibiotics may be key. So a little bit of microbiology about C. diff. It lives in your gut. You can have it but have no symptoms. It spreads from person to person via spores. That's where the diarrhea comes in. Spores are hard to kill, and antibiotics and other medicines that change your gut biology can allow C. diff to flourish and symptoms to develop. So if we look at the research study, the research study was one of the byproducts of that 
spike in our C. diff rate. And it was a collaboration between BCU Health Board, Public Health Wales, and the Nuffield Department of Medicine at Oxford University. The study was, other, was designed to understand whether the higher transmission rates we had were due to increased within hospital transmission or whether there was something else going on. So what the study was going to do was going to take cases from patients over a six-month period. We had 400 patients. And we were going to whole genome sequence their bacteria. We managed to successfully sequence 75% of the samples. We hope, hope the whole genome sequencing data would allow us to distinguish between infections triggered by transmission events, so patient to patient, patient to environment to patient, or some other cause. So whole genome sequencing is a word of three words that are becoming more and more common, and it's starting to be used to determine the relatedness of clinical cases in pathogen microbiology. A colleague of mine says it's a bit like saying we built a plane and then we flew it. I'm not a microbiologist, but it, the complexities behind it are enormous. It involves taking clinical samples, isolating bacteria, they're anaerobic bacteria, they're hard to grow, to grow the bacteria, extract the DNA, and sequence the entire genome. Sequencing the genome allows us to compare one sample to another, and then we are able to work out whether there is an epidem epidemiological link between those samples. The way we do that is through something called SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms. So this is a bit like going back to your school biology. DNA has got four building blocks. These building blocks can change and mutate over time. The image represents the same strand of DNA taken from two different organisms. In the bottom image, the C has changed to a T. That is a SNP, or that's a polymorphism. Within C. diff, you'd expect to see two SNPs different over a six-month period to suggest that those organisms had a common ancestor any more than that, and they had different ancestors. So field epidemiologists count cases or health events and describe them in terms of time, place, and person. When you get a grouping of cases in the same place over a short period of time, that is a cluster. John Snow was the father of epidemiology and is famous for his work on understanding cholera in London in the 1840s and 50s. One of the techniques he used was mapping to show incidence of cases, incidence and clustering of cases. In the map above, each little bar is a patient who has died from cholera. Today, a cluster might be a number of patients on a ward, all developing C. diff at the same time, or one after another. So just a quick recap. C. diff is transmitted via spores. Some antibiotics can lead to C. diff infections. Infections occur in clusters. We are hoping that the whole genome sequence data might allow us to identify biological clusters. I was not part of the original project team and became involved through serendipity partway through. The original plan was to undertake a traditional epidemiological study with research academic output, probably in the form of scientific papers and recommendations. Excel and stats packages such as STATA were going to be the main tool for analysing the data. My involvement began with a phone call from the project lead, whom I didn't know. He heard I had some great software and I wondered if I would have a go at creating a Gantt, chart, a Gantt chart type timeline for him of hypothetical patients staying on different wards and overlay that data with the incidence of C. diff. He sent me a file. I did a bit of Googling because I'd never done Gantt charts in Tableau before. And this is what I sent him back about 30 minutes later. He was just blown away by what I'd done. Um, and from then on, the whole, di the whole direction of the project changed dramatically. But having been said, we still did all the hard science, or Oxford had done the hard science for us. We did the engagement with the clinicians. It took six months to generate the genomics sequence data, 
And in that time, we put together data sets and dashboards into which we could add our headline data once it arrived. We worked to source as many different data sets as possible to help build a picture. We had the data on the patients from the study. We had GP prescribing data, hospital usage data, cleanliness data, anything we seemed to get, get our hands on that was relevant. Because we were an integrated health board, it may have perhaps been easier for us to get both primary and secondary care data. The original data sets would have made an analyst's heart shudder, and obviously we didn't have data prep. We had that dreadful combination of wide Excel spreadsheets, free text entries, no standardized, standardized coding. Much of my time just seemed to be spent knitting data sets together in the background, building lookup tables, trying to rationalize wall type, walls with different names. However, we got there. Um, we did all our development pretty much in a single workbook, connecting to whatever data sets we found. And then, as has been kind of discussed several times in the conference, we were just playing with the data. What helped with our story? Different, different chart types. Was there a message? Was it useful? Was it not? And that whole iterative cycle of looking and understanding our data more and more deeply. Somewhere along the line, I'd picked up, I don't know where, that, that you could do site plans in Tableau. Um, and I thought it'd be fantastic to transfer the data into like a hospital environment and made a phone call to the state. So I was thought we were like 1.3 billion pound organization. We must have some digital site plans, surely. But all they could do was send me PDFs that are slightly on the skew for our hospitals. So I spent one very sad Christmas between Christmas and one very sad time period between Christmas and New Year redrawing those site plans in paint. And then you know, paints come to my rescue so many times. It's like your go-to tool to get out of jail. So we got it into paint, and then we could use it to frame our data. And it was a hard exercise to go to, but it worked, I think it worked fantastically for one of our smaller hospitals. So this is our smallest hospital. So kind of taking the lead from John Snow, we had our wards at the top, the circles were the number of C. diff cases that happened in each of the wards, then clicking on the wards allowed you to bring up other metrics about that ward. So on the left, bottom left hand side you've got information on various credits for cleaning audits we had to do, we had to do nursing audits, estate audits, so we could show whether audits had been undertaken, whether, they, whether audits had been passed or failed. We then chucked in some data on closed beds, which is always a contentious issue within um, hospitals. And then through talking to some of the costing guys, I managed to get some ward state data, which allowed us to, to try and look at a concept of churn. We've just got a new prison in North Wales, so churn is quite important, churn of, churn of prisoners, through the, through the pris prisoners through the prison. And I wanted to look at it in terms of ward churn. So on the bottom right, what you have is quite a noisy graph. So the light pink are patients who were on a ward for a 24-hour period. And the, the darker print, pink is the number of patients who are admitted or discharged from that ward in this, on the same day. So you could get a feel for the busier wards or the quieter wards. I think one thing to think about is, that, is our, um, our, geog our geography is big. Our hospitals are very discreet, so somebody in one hospital wouldn't know another, wouldn't know the wards, so it's about being able to show the data to people who are not cognizant with, with that hospital. Um, on the bottom of the chart on the right, you've got the little crosses, um, the, like the stars and the crosses for our C. diff cases, so you could see when, when we had incidents of C. diff on that ward. The site plan worked fantastically for the smaller hospital, but for some of our larger hospitals that had a very big footprint, it was not nearly as useful, so I'm not quite sure. Well, no, it was just we would need to look at it from a different way. And in the end, what we did was we had a just drop down so you could choose a ward and it would show you the data. But you lost that geographical context, because I suppose what we had been hoping to see was whether there were hot spots within the hospital geographically and the C. diff had developed. So, this was our genomics data when it came back in. And um, I've coloured some of the lines that came back into an Excel spreadsheet. 
So if you look at column L, look at the buff colored 43. So any samples, each row is a sample. Any samples that have the same code belong to the same cluster at that two snip cutoff. Um, so I've got column four, I've got 43 colored in there. Um, I've got some blue ones because the darker blue ones, they're related at a 500 SNP cluster, but let's say the, the bacteria are related, but much further back in evolutionary time. So by using a combination of SNP data at different lengths, it's possible for the really clever scientists to generate a phylogenetic or family tree for us. And this is our family tree. The image could almost have, have come from Tableau, but it's created from in, some interactive software called MicroReact, which has been developed by the Wellcome Sanger Institute to explore phylogenetic trees. So the top half shows the entirety of our tree. And just to put computing into context, it took a week and a half of computer time to generate this phylogenetic tree for us. Um, like any tree, like any evolutionary tree, the length of the lines describes how closely related the samples are one to another. Specimens have been colored by the, patient, by the location in which the sample was taken. And on the bottom left, you can see I've just highlighted data for the month of February. And so samples taken in the month of February span the breadth of our phylogenetic tree, which suggests that our bacteria are really very diverse. So this is, this is a histogram which shows our samples or our clusters. So along the y-axis, you've got all our cluster codes. I'm oh, sorry, along, along the x-axis, you've got our cluster clothes. The y-axis is the number of specimens is N in any one cluster. And the data suggests or shows that we only had one cluster code which had seven specimens in it. We had a few that had five, one that had five, a few that had four, a few that had three, and a bunch that had two. But from our sample of 400, from our sample of 400 patients, the majority of patients had bacteria that was, not infect, that was not related to any other bacteria within our sample. So that says that a lot of the problems were not to do with the breakdown of infection control immediately. Yeah. Um, so only 25% of our samples had a genetic cluster and over 75% of the samples were not genetically related to any other sample in the data set. So the results showed that we had got some tr transmission events, but 75% infect of those bacterial infections had been triggered by something else. On reflection, I think if we didn't have, stat if we didn't have Tableau, then the stata experts would have taken over here. The analysis would have been vigorous and robust. All the rich data we had, ha we had collected would be reduced to correlation coefficients and p-values, and any conclusions would have been received and understood by a very limited audience. As it was, we could now use Tableau to explore the richness of the and granularity of the data and start to tell stories. Before I talk about the majority of our cases, let's look at how Tableau helped us understand our clusters. So this is cluster 43, this is our biggest cluster, um, and this is the first patient in the cluster. The blue blocks are hospitals, the purple is when the patient went home, you've got time moving left to right, and the little cross is when they tested positive for C. diff. We combined it with a map to see if we could see geographically where our patients were as well. So that's our first patient. Our second patient drops in and their test is on the same day. So they have symptoms of C. diff that are tested on the same day. They're in the same hospital. The third patient drops in. They were in that hospital and they tested positive for C. diff after they'd left. Fourth patient drops in. 
It had been in Hospital 1. They then moved to Hospital 2 where they developed C. diff. Fifth patient had been in Hospital 1. Sixth patient had never been in Hospital 1 but had been in Hospital 2. Rather frustratingly, the seventh patient didn't overlap any of the other patients in the timeline. They had the same biological strain, so they had to have caught it somewhere, but we don't quite know how. So it could have been that we've missed a case that goes between six and seven, or we had a piece of equipment that had moved, or we had a healthcare worker or a visitor, but there was some reason um, that we can't, sorry, we can't see how the, the, how the, tra the infection moved from patient six to patient seven. Having looked at the data at hospital level, you can then take it down one step lower and look at it by ward level. If the pointer works. Is it pointing? Yes, it's pointing. So you can begin to see this purple ward AG is common to the first three sets of patients. This grey ward DU is common to patient two and four, so you can begin to see where the problems were in which wards. And two patients that moved into another hospital again both shared the same ward. So obviously something was going on in some of our wards which suggested that we had got breakdowns in infection control. What's quite interesting about this data set is that if we didn't have the genetics, we wouldn't have known that it was a cluster. So if we just go back, we had an isolated case, number seven would have been an isolated case in hospital three, we had two cases in hospital two, and we had four in hospital one. So hospital one might have been picked up as a, no, we had three in hospital one, so hospital one might have been picked up as a cluster, maybe not two, and certainly not three. So it gives, gives us a different perspective on our infection. Once we developed our ward stay dashboards, we could then start to link in other data sets. So this allowed us, so the top bit is our cluster, and then what we could do is we could select a ward and see all the other patients in our data set who had stayed on that ward. <laughs> and we could see overlaps of different strains of bacteria coming through, again in timelines. We could also take it down to patient level. So, Patient seven had a high risk antibiotic some two weeks before they developed C. diff. So clinicians could begin to see the interaction between the antibiotic prescribing and the um, outbreaks of infection at a, at a patient level. And I think that where this became really useful and where Tableau became really useful was that we built a story with all our dashboards and rather than taking a very static presentation round to clinicians in the different hospitals, we could take a dynamic presentation round and really focus on what they were interested in. <laughs> so we went out to, we did grand rounds, we visited GP groups um, and show them their data rather than a generalised story about the C. diff story in North Wales. So if our study showed that 25% of our cases had at least one other link case, what about the other 75% where there didn't appear to be any linkage? So I've already mentioned before that the research evidence, including evidence from this study, is supporting the role of the overuse of antibiotics in driving up C. diff rates. So it became important for us to visualise what our health board was doing in terms of antibiotic prescribing and compare it locally and nationally. So if we now got a look at the prescribing data. So anybody who works for the NHS in England will live in a world of strange maps where Wales is greyed out or doesn't exist and we live in the other world, so we live in the world of Wales and no comparisons with England. And this is one of our 
prescribing maps, and it's something that one of the maps that I've produced nationally. So this is antibacterial prescribing rates by our unitary authorities, of which we have 22. And medicines managers in North Wales would maybe think, OK, we've got a problem with four of our six unitary authorities, but I'm not going to really bother with the um, two bl blue ones. I've got other things that I need to really put effort into. And that's how we were viewing our data. It's really difficult, certainly in early, uh, early Tableau days, to get health boundaries that you could join together. Um, and I'm not sure, it might have been an InfoWorks boundary set or um, an information lab one. The information lab, I think, produced CCG boundaries. And I managed to merge them with our unitary authority boundaries. And I also managed to get a common antibiotic prescribing data set um, for England and Wales. And the first time this was shown, there was a sharp intake of breath because it had just put all our Welsh prescribing into a completely different perspective. So you were bad. Um, and what was quite useful was because I got some categories from the English data. I was able to filter the map because everybody's going, oh, they're not quite like us, they're not quite like us. So I could get rid of... I get rid of urban university in a London type demographic so that we were just looking at Wales compared to the rural, the rural CCGs and perhaps not surprisingly it didn't change the story. Our prescribing was high. I think one of the reasons our prescribing is high is for some reason we prescribe 25% more items in Wales than we do in England. But certainly widening the context began to change the narrative of in, in North Wales and we have prescribing advisors out in all our GP practices and antibiotic prescribing has become a real priority for us to try and drive it down partly because of the C. diff and partly because we're so high and it's going to be a real problem okay so so that was work that was all done a couple of years ago. Um, so now if I just leap into Tableau. So I said I'm partly work nationally and partly work locally. So on a national scale, I work for the Welsh Analytical Prescribing Support Unit. And I'm responsible for doing work around, among other things, our national prescribing indicators. And this is all done on Tableau, and this is some dashboards that I've put up. And I've put this one up because it's our antibiotic prescribing data um, for the last few years. And this is, this is us, this is BCU. Antibiotic data is seasonal, so you can see the... the the humps in the winter, and this is quarterly data, so you can see the humps in the winter and the, um, the dips in the summer. But from our perspective, what is fantastic is that as a health board, we've moved from the, the second highest prescriber in quarter 4, 13, 14, to almost the second lowest prescriber for the last quarter. So the effort that's been made... Actually, they are the second lowest. So the effort that's been made in driving our antibiotic prescribing down is really beginning to, to pay benefits. Um, this is another of the dashboards that's been developed, um, picking up on, I think, one of the four, a four quadrant type view of the data. So what we've got along the y-axis is items per thousand PU, so it's a weighted antibiotic usage. And what we've got along the x-axis is the percentage of bacteria, called the full Cs, that are known to um, be associated with an increased risk of C. diff, so they're the broad-spectrum antibiotics. The red dots are all our BCU GP practices, and the little tiny grey flecks are other practices in Wales and the crosshairs are the average lines. Um, what the dashboard allows you to do is it allows you to drill down and highlight. So 
these are practices in, in one of our clusters in North Wales, so you can begin to see variation and spread across the practices. You can also take it back. So it was doing this before. Don't do this. I want to put them all back in. Take it out of practice. Get him. GPs tend to want to be part of the pack. They don't want to be outliers. And um, but equally they don't get a lot of useful comparisons. So to be able to look at them relative to all their peers and show them when they're exposed um, is starting to change behaviour and it's very easy for people to take screenshots and get them through to the pharmacist who then have influences in this practice. Something's not quite right, right here. The trend for both of these antibacterials are growing up. Going up. Um, our practice would probably feel quite exposed. So this is one of our tools to help encourage better prescribing. So this is work that happens nationally. The data gets updated on a quarterly basis um, from national indicator data that's generated centrally from prescriptions that we all use. At a local level, we are now pushing Tableau out into our GP practices. Um, this is a static screenshot of our performance metrics for our practices. So it's a combination of run charts, tables, ticks and crosses, um, which is now available for all practices within North Wales. So the pharmacy advisors and the practice managers can access this and see, again, see how they're performing relative to their peers, which again is to do with driving change. We, Medicines are very well analysed and scrutinised, partly because there's never any doubt about the data, certainly in primary care. Most health data, the quality is always questioned. But prescribing data, it's well trusted. And also, it's the area where savings can be made within the NHS, so we're always scrutinising it, looking at spend, looking at spend relative to our peers. Um, I think I'm going really quickly. Oh, no. so I'm really, this is this is another dashboard that we have made available to our GP practices. I've just mentioned spend. So what this does is it allows practices to look at drug basket switches. So we've got a combination of a tree map with um, really. they're, they're being asked to target certain antibiotics and certain medicines and reduce their prescribing of them and then move to preferred bands. And the Likert chart shows how they're going on, so how their numbers are moving from the targeted to the preferred. And then we get a measure of the savings that are generated um, and this, this one switch over a financial year would have saved us £5,000 and all these savings then add up um, and, help, and help pay for other things because we're always in deficit. We're just about to move into analysing the acute prescribing data we have very poor secondary care. We have, I was going to say, we have very poor secondary care prescribing data. Our secondary care prescribing data is very much cost-based. So if you wanted to do a cost-based analysis of the data, then it's very, very robust. But if you wanted to do a volume-based analysis, it's much more challenging to use. You don't have that problem in primary care. So I'm not aware of anybody in Wales who is doing any real volume analysis of any any. 
Yeah, hospital. Sorry. Yeah, so our hospital prescribing data is, is not easy to analyze. Um, and this is the beginning of some run charts to begin to look at, at that data. And again, to look at change, because we can't monitor it, we can't encourage clinicians to reduce their prescribing because we've got nothing to, to show them. So we're just about to start to roll this out within the next month, um, which I think will be... I was going to say it's a first. For, I think it will be a first for us, for a health board, first for Wales. I'm not sure that anybody else is, is tackling it. Um, and for the first time ever, though, we have targets to reduce our antibiotic prescribing within hospitals. The final slide, the final interactive slide I've got is. It's going back to a slide I showed air earlier, which is the map. And this is some work that I'm doing nationally about just trying to build users really, really simple dashboards that they can then download images from. And um, so that's the data we showed earlier. If we now put in our latest quarter data, you can see that across the north, the doctors and the pharmacists and the techs have worked really hard and our antibiotic prescribing rate has fallen dramatically and we're no longer in the horrible brownie red end of the prescribing and we're much more in line with everybody else. And that's, a, that's a credit to the staff but I think it's also about the fact that we started to make the data available for them. They could see what was happening, they could understand what was happening, people were talking about it. And, and Tableau just helps get the image. It looks good, people can easily see what's happening, and it's really helped us in moving all those practices and all those prescribers. Because in the end, everything starts with a prescription. And it's, you've got to influence all the doctors to prescribe less, patients to want less, before we can begin to bring our rates down. I just whiz to the end. So, just to finish off, really, so at a national level, the Pathogen, Pathogen Genomics Unit was started in February 2000, 2018 by Public Health Wales. Um, that's bringing all the sequencing technology and skills that Oxford did, used into Wales. Um, and we are going to be doing real-time C. diff cluster reporting and clus we're going to be doing real-time sequencing of C. diff. Information is going to go back to the health boards and we're going to be able to monitor clusters across the whole of Wales. And Tableau is going to be one of the tools that we're going to be using for that analysis and making the data available back, with, back to the health boards. I put this slide in because I'm coming to the end of my talk and it's really weird. I thought it was really clear and maybe it's just an example of how people see visuals really differently. The guy that I was showing my talk to thought I'd moved into a substance misuse talk at this point, and it was all to do with coke or heroin or something. It's like, no, no. It's just to say that I've been lucky enough to come to the Tableau conference for a number of years now, and, um, and I kind of see it as a bit of a cross between both of these, a the spoonful of sugar and the flu jab, because working in the NHS can be quite challenging at times, and it's really good to just be somewhere where there is so much energy and enthusiasm for what people do. And it kind of rubs off on you. So two days in Tableau kind of picks you up for the year and um, sets you off all the networking, the tips and tricks and things that you, you pick up. So it's kind of the sweetness of like the energy and then those, that flu shot that will keep you through the next year of kind of working at the cold face to get things done and make things better for patients in the NHS. And it's our birthday today. So, Jochen Vaar, and thank you. And 
are there any questions? When you were, is it working? Yeah. When you were showing your study on the prescribing drugs and you were comparing practices, are you also linking your data to demographic data? Because I'm thinking that maybe practice is twice the size of another one, or maybe they, they were weighted. So it uses. We there are a range of different prescribing weightings that you can use. So all the data was was weighted for the practice list size. So yes. Okay, but you didn't, but did you incorporate them into your tableau or did you wait to the data? Prior. Prior, okay. That data set, because it's our national prescribing indicator data, so it's national data, so that comes to us in a weighted format, so that's generated nationally for us. But some of our other data so all the data that showed was weighted. So when you were looking at the, the maps and things, those were all weighted data sets. They weren't absolute values. Uh, thanks for the talk. I really enjoyed seeing these types of results in Tableau rather than other stuff uh, so far. I was just wondering how many people are driving these type of dashboard. Are you working on this on your own or you have a oh, yeah. on your own? Yeah. Very impressive. Nice. Me. <laughs> it's me. <laughs> yeah. But it's like it's the power. I mean, but that that in itself says something that I can that you can do it on your own. That the community is such like the Gantt chart. I had no idea how to do that. I just got this email saying, can you do that? I'm saying, I'm sure I can do that. Somebody will have done it somewhere. You just look it up, download it, work it out. So um, you can move quite rapidly with it. And once you've got people who are interested in working with you, the guy that I was working with was fantastic because he just, he just got it. And so he became enthusiastic. And he, I mean, he's the one who's done all the selling, the project leads. So he's been out to so many different sites to talk people through the data. And... And I showed him this talk last week, and he was throwing things in that I'd forgotten about, about how important it was to engage with the... Because I kind of get caught up with the technology, but he was the one who was taking it and using it and talking to the clinicians and getting their feedback and getting their real... Get it, beginning to help them to understand the complexity of the story. And they kind of love the data. They love the fact that we could reduce research to something that was very accessible and and understandable, otherwise it would have just, like I say, all that richness would have been a p-value and a correlation coefficient. Nobody would have got down into the granularity of it. Hi, uh, I just wanted to ask how your, uh, the users of the dashboard, um, how it was to engage with them and get them to adopt the dashboards. Was that quite an easy process? or? The CDIF stuff was very much research-based, so that was, that was us taking the story out. The, um, the national work is it's out there. It's a lot better than anything else we had. Everything used to be dreadful, sorry, it used to be Excel spreadsheets that were really, really static, so we've had no problems in, in getting uptake there. Um, we've got a conference on next Tuesday when we're going to roll it out to a bigger audience. And certainly with the national indicator data, with seriously thinking about Tableau Public, to so just make it all available, because they're public data sets anyway. You could download the data and generate your own, your own versions of it. So, um, so no, that's, that's been surprisingly easy, and it's only me supporting it, really. It's surprisingly stable. Uptake just keeps kind of going up quarter on quarter. Happy birthday to start with, <laughs> um, and really interesting, um, and love the way that, you, you know, you can really see the prescription rates coming down. Has that translated into um, a saving for NHS Wales? Not as far as antibiotics, because antibiotics are, are not particularly expensive medicines. It would make savings in other areas, maybe, but not... Um, Antibiotics. Now, prescribing indicators are not selected from a savings perspective. They're usually selected from a quality perspective. Some of our local prescribing initiatives are very much based on savings and generating savings. 
to then put money back into the service for other things. So we do save money. Okay, thank you.